Thing. Order! Order! You are an incorrigible delinquent at times. <laughs> Behave yourself, man! Right, what's the economic effect of Brexit? There is an official assessment. It's made the news in the last two days as it was leaked to the online news service BuzzFeed and it offers a Whitehall view of the economic effects of different Brexit scenarios, all negative compared to staying in the EU. It's an awkward conclusion. The government has experimented with different ways of trying to shrug it off. Uh, one response was those civil servants, they get up to all sorts of mischief. Then there was, it's just preliminary and incomplete, move along, nothing to see. But after saying that they wouldn't publish the analysis today, the government said they would. And let me start with the terms of the motion. We will provide the analysis to the Select Committee for Exiting the European Union and all members on a strictly confidential basis. This means we will provide a hard copy of the analysis to the Chair of the EU Select Committee. Uh, and a confidential reading room will be available to all members and peers to see a copy of this analysis once those arrangements can be made. Well, that may or may not change anybody's mind uh, when it comes. But without waiting, we now have a little bit more uh, from the leaked document because BuzzFeed have released a line on what it says about the estimated effect of reducing EU immigration. Alberto Nardelli, is BuzzFeed's Europe editor, is with us. He was the man who received the leaked document. Um, Alberto, so what, mm. what is the line on immigration? Well, I think the, the point on immigration in the analysis is that it shines a light on one of the other conundrums that this government is currently facing. Basically, it shows that under uh, different potential policy scenarios, on the one hand, the number of people from the European Union arriving in the UK would be reduced by about 40 to 90,000 uh, people a year. However, this produces a hit uh, on the uh, economy and the trouble that the government had that the upsides of Brexit, so for example this trade deal with the, with the United States, the uh, value to GDP that this would provide is far smaller than that hit and this is the issue which cuts across throughout right. this document. So we knew that the general economic effect was negative but specifically the benefit of going off and saying to the US we can now trade to you because we're not in the customs union in the single market is is offset by the fact that you, your immigration control is, is, is that you now have the freedom to apply to, to oppose that's going to wipe out the benefits of more than wipe out the benefits of the absolutely and i think that's the issue so if you look at this uh document there is no scenario in which non-tariff uh, barriers even if the uk were to stay in the single market uh, through the european economic area it would not be, it would be able to mitigate some of those losses, but there is no scenario in which mm. all of those losses would be eliminated. And, and, and that's the problem, because this document doesn't aim to refight the referendum. What it does is says, Britain's leaving the European Union. These are the upsides. These are the downsides. Uh, this is what they look like in terms of impact on the economy. Now ministers decide what you would like but to look, do. But look, in all the things you've said uh, and published out of it, and you haven't published it all because you have to protect your sources and, 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 and need to worry about whether certain things will identify any source, of all of them, th the upside effect of a trade deal with the US is estimated at approximately zero, isn't it? I mean, 0 in 50... 0.2%. But that's how, big, how much bigger our economy is in 15 years' time. Absolutely. 0.2% bigger, which is, uh, you know, a, a, a bad week in the... Uh... And the document also includes, as we mentioned in the first article that we published, that trade deals with China, Australia, New Zealand, the Gulf countries uh, and the ASEAN countries, the sum of those would add about 0 0.2 to 0.4% so of it's, GDP it's, it's in 15 It's really years. very little over 15 years. Absolutely. Alberto, thank you very much. Well, uh, let's talk about those implications. I'm joined by two of the biggest beasts from the conservative jungle. Peter Bone was a founding member of the Grassroots Out campaign that wasn't affiliated to the official Leave campaign and had a strong emphasis on the need to cut immigration. Uh, and Ken Clark, of course, passionate Remainer, former cabinet minister and father of the House. Very good evening. Peter Bone, what do you make of, well, specifically the immigration stuff, that they really finding immigration is a negative? You, you, you knew that though, right? Well, good evening. And the great news is we're now only 422 <laughs> days away from <laughs> withdrawing from this yes, terrible answer European the question. Union answer super the question. safe. Um, on the immigration thing, obviously this is Project Fear Mark II. Uh, we had Project Fear before the referendum. Uh, the British public listened to all the arguments, listened to the economic arguments, 
and they decided to vote to but leave. Is it but your view the... that immigration restrictions will improve the economy or will have some cost? Because well, Nigel I... Farage says, look, I think there'll be a cost, but I'm, I'm willing no, to accept that. I think on immigration, the key thing is we're going to have a fairer immigration system. We're going to have the same rules and regulations across the whole world. We are not going to discriminate in favour of the European Union. So, for instance, an unemployed person from European, from, say, Romania or somewhere could come into the country now Whereas a doctor or nurse from India has to go through all the hoops. What we're going to do is have a fairer immigration system, and of course, whichever party is in power, whichever government is in power. They can calibrate it however they want. Exactly. Yeah, yeah. Ken Clark, should we take these figures seriously? They have been quite poo pooed by a, a, a number of Brexiteers who say, look at the forecast last time before the referendum. The immediate forecasts weren't... weren't no, I, I think the analyses are helpful, so as you understand what they are. Uh, and it's just absolutely silly. The, the present silly debate we're having on Brexit is just made sillier if everybody rejects any expert who comes up with something that doesn't happen to fit his or her side of the argument. This is the best that the civil service have been able to do, and it's, uh, they're very high-powered people, uh, to make a serious, objective assessment of the impacts of the economy of the things that might change because it acknowledges the uncertainty of exactly what we're going to do to alter our economic relationships, exactly what we're going to do to immigration and so on. And this was briefing for cabinet ministers. This is the kind of thing that as a cabinet minister I would expect to have from the officials giving me their best expert objective assessment. But they might be subject to the groupthink that we know people do get subject to and they may have restrictive models that you know build in all the effects. Well, well, well I might be affected by the groupthink. I mean I, I think uh, most of the economic changes vis-a-vis -vis Europe, leaving the single market, leaving the customs union uh, is going to damage our economy. Uh, we're leaving one of the richest multinational <laughs> free trade agreements in the world uh, and th this is an expert attempt to say to it's going to affect the economy by about this amount. Similarly, everybody's always known that if we, the immigrants uh, from the EU, the young people coming here to take jobs where we need their skills or where they're taking jobs that British people won't take for some reason in the hospitality industry, are adding to our economy. Mm. So the more we Bo restrict them, cost. So this is just a, a perfectly fair effort to estimate uh, what the impact might be. It's not exact, but it's the best estimate that anybody is likely to be able to make. Peter they should be published to the public and the Cabinet should be allowed to see them without being well, locked let, in. Let, let's let's go on that one. Peter, do you agree that everyone should be allowed to see these so they can reach their own judgment? I mean, just, well, just they, in a they, word. First of all, there are documents that uh, haven't been completed. They were, as Ken said, in preparation for the Cabinet, never got there. Didn't even no 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 didn't even look <laughs> at what Theresa May is trying to achieve. He didn't even look at that model. And, and if we're going to talk about experts, well, why don't we talk about Professor Minford, who says we're going to be vastly well, better Of course, off. you can pick and your expert. Exactly. You can pick and your he expert. has been proved more right than the no, Treasury. No, uh, the, uh, you know, uh, the uh, Treasury uh, got it totally wrong uh, before. Uh, Was that a political thing, or did they just get it wrong? Pat Patrick Minford is almost the exactly. only economist I know who thinks we just open our uh, uh, tariffs for everybody. But he's been more better. right than he the Treasury. He right said the there would not well, be a disaster after the referendum. It, it, there wasn't. The Treasury said there was. We, we, That's a poor, fact, Ken. They're poorer since the referendum. They overestimate. Oh. Uh, well, what about employment? Let me ask you. The, 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 One the, last answer. The, 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 there's no doubt that large sections of the population are poorer now than they would have been if we voted Remain. Because the of Remain the exchange rate effect. set off a devaluation because it damaged confidence in sterling assets. That caused inflation. The real wages of many people are not keeping up with this inflation. We have record it's employment. Made us, it's made us, uh, and the, the, the lowest the, unemployment for okay. 40 years. That I think, I think what we've demonstrated... The reason we need analysis I, I, is to I, stop I, having slogans from Brexiteers. Right. We're going to leave it there. This nonsense to denounce Thank you so much, any both. attempt to analyse. I think, a very big problem for the country. I think we've demonstrated that having a few numbers doesn't necessarily <laughs> resolve the argument. Uh, it, just it, it, it pushes it on to the next phase. Thank you both. Well, Brexit and its complications followed Theresa May around the world like a shadow. While she tried to woo the Chinese leader over a cup of lapsang, she was reassuring worried Brexiteers at home that freedom of movement will indeed end in March 2019. Meanwhile, it's the mandarins in Whitehall that are battling the government. For the second time in a week, Brexit Minister Steve Baker is in trouble over comments about the performance of Treasury civil servants. Here's Paul McNamara. 
It was meant to be just another day in the Commons, another day for Brexit ministers to answer questions. But things can change pretty fast in Westminster, especially when one of Parliament's most notable performers makes an allegation like this. Mr Jacob Rees-Mogg. Uh, thank you, Mr Speaker. Will my honourable friend, the Minister and Member for Wickham, confirm that he heard from Charles Grant for the Centre of European Research that officials in the Treasury had deliberately developed a model to show that all options other than staying in the customs union were bad? That's ardent Brexiteer Jacob Rees-Mogg asking a minister to confirm hearing rumours that civil servants are deliberately skewing data to make Brexit outcomes look as bad as possible. So how did the minister respond? Mr Speaker, I'm sorry to say that uh, my honourable friend's account is essentially correct. Uh, a straightforward response, but one Brexit minister, Steve Baker, felt he needed to clarify just moments later. I, well, the honourable gentleman says it was correct. I didn't say it was correct. I said it, the, the, the account, the account that, that that was put to me, Mr Speaker, is correct. According to Mr Baker, at a lunch in October, these claims against the civil service were made by the director of a pro-European think tank. But this afternoon, the director denied it, as did another person there. So you were there. Are civil servants skewing the numbers? Well, that certainly wasn't said at that meeting. I was there, and if, if it had been said, everybody would have sat up and taken notice. This is not the story the government wants in the headlines today. This week is meant to be all about Theresa May reaching out beyond Europe's borders and signing trade deals with China. On Brexit, the Prime Minister today drawing a line in the sand on one of the most emotive issues of the referendum, EU citizens' rights during the transition period. Instead, yet again, her message has been, if not overshadowed, then at least marred by squabbling within her own party. Representatives for the civil service are enraged and say question marks hang over Steve Baker's suitability for government. So is he the right man for the job? That's a matter for the Prime Minister. Come on, is he fit to be a minister? Well, on the, on the basis of the last two exchanges in Parliament, I think Steve Baker should be thinking about whether he is able to or wants to represent the government as a whole or whether he wants to represent a particular wing of the Conservative Party. This evening, Downing Street said they are sticking by their man saying there is no reason to doubt Steve Baker's account. Now, the government minister, Steve Baker, was forced to apologise in the House of Commons today for appearing to suggest that some civil servants were conspiring against Brexit. It's meant yet more trouble on the Tory benches while Theresa May has been away. Our political correspondent, Michael Crick, is in Westminster now. Michael, what's the word there? Well, yesterday, Cathy, in the House of Commons, uh, Jacob Rees-Mogg, the Brexiteer Tory backbencher, asked Steve Baker, the Brexit uh, minister, about a suggestion based on uh, a, what appears to be an erroneous account uh, from, uh, that, uh, attributed to Charles Grant, erroneously attributed to Charles Grant, um, whether, uh, whether civil servants in the Treasury uh, had uh, deliberately constructed a model whereby the only uh, way in which uh, uh, Britain wouldn't be worse off under Brexit uh, would be if we remained in the customs union. Um, and uh, Steve Baker uh, responded yesterday in saying that was essentially correct. Well, today he had to come along to the House of Commons and issue this embarrassing apology. I accept that I should have corrected or dismissed the premise of my honourable friend's question. I have apologised to Mr Charles Grant, who is an honest and trustworthy man. As I have put on record many times, I have the highest regard for our hard-working civil servants. I am grateful for this early opportunity to correct the record, Mr Deputy Speaker, and I apologise to the House. Well, as for Jacob Rees-Mogg, he's been involved tonight in uh, what looked like some fairly uh, ugly scuffles at a student meeting at the University of the West of England. He hasn't been apologising today. On the contrary, he says that uh, in a published uh, recording of uh, a lunch with Charles Grant rather suggests that officials in the Treasury or the Chancellor have indeed been conspiring to undermine Brexit and push for a soft Brexit. Meanwhile, today, splits within the cabinet. The split within the cabinet has become more apparent as uh, Theresa May and Liam Fox have been flying back from China. Before he left to return to London, Liam Fox did an interview uh, with uh, Bloomberg in which he said that 
uh, uh, which he denounced the idea of any customs union between Britain and the EU as being incompatible with Britain striking its own trade deals with other countries. Now, that is not the line taken by Theresa May and Downing Street. She says she has an open mind on this. All options are now still open. But with Michel Barnier in London on Monday to resume the negotiations uh, and to meet Mrs May and David Davis and important meetings of cabinet ministers, uh, these issues are going to be have to be resolved fairly soon as to what stance, uh, what kind of relationship Britain does indeed want with the European Union after Brexit. Michael, thanks very much.